Today we're going to pick up where we left off in class. We had done chapter two, section one. We introduced the concept of um, sets and we looked at some specific sets of numbers like natural numbers and whole numbers and um, rational numbers and irrational numbers. And um, we also talked about what it means to find the cardinality of a set, which means the number of elements in a set, if you recall. Um, and we introduced the idea of subsets and when sets are equal. So we're going to continue there. One of the ways we're going to be working with sets is by drawing Venn diagrams. Um, we're going to find something called the complement of a set. We're going to um, not only identify when something is a subset of a set, but also count how many subsets a set has and how many proper subsets a set has. So um, when we're working with uh, sets, we draw pictures of them called Venn diagrams. And when we do that, we have to kind of agree on what the the universal set is on what's the scope of our um, of possibility that we're discussing and we denote this universal set um, as U. Now you might wonder where the name Venn diagrams comes from. Venn diagrams were developed by a logician named John Venn and um, he always represented the universal set with a rectangle and then the sets within the universal set are circles. So a very simple Venn diagram that has exactly one uh, set depicted in it would be this one. You see U for the universal set and you see the circle A for um, some other set within the set U. So for example, Let's suppose that our universe of possibilities includes the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So that's our universal set. Then maybe the set A could be the odd natural numbers less than 6. So which elements of U fit that description? And I'm going to pull up my, if I can, pull up my chat box here. So go ahead and type into the chat box, if you would, um, which elements of U are um, odd natural numbers that are less than six. Does anyone know which of the numbers one, two, three, four, five fit that description? Very good, one, three, and five fit that description, good. So I'm going to put the elements one, three, and five in the circle that represents A. And now which elements remain that are not in A? They're in our universal set U, but they're not in A. Which ones are left? Very good, two and four are, uh, not six, because six is actually not in the universal set. If you notice, the universal set only goes up to five, but two and four are, right? So I'm gonna put two and four on the outside of A. Now, speaking of the part that's outside of A, this part has a name of its own. It's the complement of A. Everything that's not in A, but is in the universal set is called the complement of A. It, we, we denote it with a little um, apostrophe, so A with a little dash up and to the right, and we can sometimes read that as A prime, but I usually just say A complement. So in our example, A complement consisted of the elements two and four, 
and A itself consisted of 1, 3, and 5. And the universal set U is all of it. Sometimes people think that this U being out in this region um, outside the circle means that U is only considering 2 and 4, but U is always everything. So U has 1, 2, 4, 3, and 5. Now, we talked about set builder notation in class. I'm just getting a message from a student. I'm going to respond really quick before I continue. Can everybody see the, um, the PowerPoints? Okay, Kira can see it, that's good. All right, um, so if you can't see it, maybe uh, try uh, refreshing your screen. All right, so um, we talked about set builder notation in class. Remember, um, we said that with set builder notation that, um, hold on, I'm trying to find my buttons here. Here we go. So with set builder notation, we always have the curvy set brackets. Then we'll say the set of all numbers X or some other variable. Then we draw a line that means such that. And then we have some kind of a description. We describe the set over here. All right, so this is the formal definition of the complement. And a complement is equal to the set of all numbers x such that x is in the universal set. Remember this elongated e means an element of or is in. x is in the universal set. And, but x is not in A. Okay, so A complement means it's in our universe of possibilities, but it's not in the set A. Now, there may be multiple sets that we try to depict within one universal set, and they can overlap or they can be separate, or one can be contained in the other. So here's a drawing where we have our universal set, we have a set A, and we have a set B. This also has a universal set, a set A and a set B. And so does this one. But each one of these Venn diagrams depicts a different relationship between set A and set B. In the diagram on the left, set A is contained in set B. So the way that we uh, say that is A is a subset of B. In that case, the set A is completely contained within the set B. The notation for that we saw in that little video in the last class. Remember, contained in starts with a C and we use an elongated C to show that one set is contained in the other. We have the line underneath that to show that it's possible that the two sets are actually equal. So this is the symbol for a subset. Anything that's contained in or possibly equal to the other set is a subset. So A is a subset of B is written in this way. With that in mind, let's fill in the blank with the subset symbol 
or a not a subset symbol to make a true statement. So looking at part A, guys, which one do you think is true? Is it a subset or not a subset? You tell me what to write. Okay, you say not a subset. Why is it not a subset? Well, let's just draw a picture just to make it clear. You're right, it is definitely not a subset. One is not contained in the other. For example, this element C well, actually, I take that back. It's not C. C is in the other subset, is in the other set, I should say. It's B that's the problem child here. So the element B is not actually in the other set. So ABC is not contained in ACD. So we would have to say that this is not a subset. Now, notice the direction here matters. It's just like the less than and greater than symbols that we use. So for example, it would be true to say that four is less than five, but it would be false to say that five, well, let me turn it the other way, hold on. <clears throat> it would be false to say that four is greater than five. Right, that wouldn't be true. What they are telling us to do is to determine if the set on the left is contained in the set on the right. So actually the fact that D is not in the set on the left is not an issue because it's possible for this set. For example, I could have had the set A, B, C, D and then A, B, C would have been a subset, right? It would have been okay that D, this extra letter, was in there as long as the set on the left had only elements that were in the other set. This would be true. Okay, so it's not the D that's the problem. The problem is the B, that the set on the right doesn't have the B in it. Okay, so how about... Um, well, let me draw, before we move on to part B, let me draw a little picture of what we just saw. So if we were to draw, if this is, um, let's call it the set ABC, we'll call it capital A, and the set ACD, we'll call it capital B. So I'm going to draw a picture, a Venn diagram, of set A and set B. And here's my universal set U, whatever that is. All right, so A contains A, B, and C and B contains A, C, and D. So they both contain the elements A and C. But A contains the element B, and B contains the element D. So neither one is a subset of the other. In other words, there's no way we could draw the picture like a inside of B, which is what we're wanting if it's a subset, because A contains this element B, and where would we write it? We can't write it outside of A, so if, if we have one circle inside the other, there's no place to put B. So B is the problem there. Okay, so now let's look at the set 1, 2, 3, and the set 1, 2, 3, 4. Do I write a subset or not a subset?
Yes, it is a subset because one is an element of the set on the right, two is an element of the set on the right, and three is an element of the set on the right. So this set, one, two, three, is contained in the set one, two, three, four. All right, so you could actually draw, I'm gonna draw it two different ways, just so you can see that um, when we draw Venn diagrams, we have a variety of options. When you know nothing about the relationship between the two sets, it's, and let me give them different names, let's call this set D, C, and D. Okay, so when you know nothing about the relationship between the two sets, when it's possible that they overlap, they don't overlap, that one's contained in the other or one's not contained in the other, it's safe to draw the, the Venn diagram like this. You'll always have a place to put everything. So for example here, 1, 2, and 3 need to go into C, and 1, 2, 3, and 4 need to go into D, which means that 1, 2, and 3 are in both C and D, so they're in the middle part here. So actually, I need to make that bigger because I just don't even have room to draw that. Let's see. Let's make that a little bigger. All right, so I'm going to make sure they overlap a good bit. Not exactly circles. <laughs> But that way I can fit one, two, and three in here, okay? And then four would go in the region that's only part of D over here. So we have a place to put everything, okay? But that's not the only way that one could have been drawn. Notice there's no elements of C that aren't in the overlapping part with D. That's because C is a subset of D. So another person might have drawn them in this way, putting C, which has one, two, and three in it, and then putting D, a bigger set that C is contained in, with only that extra four outside. So these would be both perfectly valid Venn diagrams. Okay, since the C is completely contained in the D, C is a subset of D, which is why I put that subset symbol there. Okay, are there any questions so far or anything you'd like me to repeat? Because if there are, you can type them into the chat bar. I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat as I go. All right, I'm going to check to on... Uh... Something here. Okay, um, if anyone is finding that their screen is a little blurry, on your end there should be a way to uh, select 360 um, to get the screen to be a little less blurry, just to let you know. Okay, um, it looks like everything's streaming okay, so I'm going to continue. Okay, um, another thing we talked about in class last time was that um, two sets are equal if they contain exactly the same, oh, I see a question. Would question B be considered a proper subset? Yes, um, let's go back to that slide. So we had mentioned in um, class last time that there's also something called a proper subset. The subset symbol actually includes two possibilities. Contained, one set's contained in the other, and then that little line underneath 
includes the possibility that the two sets are actually equal. If you know that a subset is not equal to the overall set because there's at least one element they don't have in common, uh, or sorry, I shouldn't say it that way, there's at least one element more in the bigger set, then you could use the symbol that just means contained in and not equal to. Oops, my pen is freaking out. Hold on. Okay, so this symbol on the top, this is the symbol for a subset. This is less specific. It means contained in or equal to. And this symbol down here is the symbol for what's called a proper subset. And that just emphasizes that it's not equal to. There's no equality allowed. So the question was, is in part B, could you write proper subset rather than subset? And the answer is yes, because this set is bigger. It has an extra element in it. Good question. Okay, let's go on now. And we're going to talk about an alternative definition to having two sets be equal. So we learned before that two sets are equal if they have exactly the same elements and um, another way of looking at it is if A, if you have two sets A and B and you want to know if they're equal, check to see if A is a subset of B. In other words, if every element of A is contained in B. And then check to see if B is contained in A. Every element of B is an element of A. If both of these things are true, then it must be that they have exactly the same elements, so they're equal. All right, a proper subset, as we were just discussing, um, just means that it's a subset, but it's not equal. All right, so there's going to be problems in your homework where you're asked and on your tests where you're asked to decide if it's a subset, a proper subset, or both. And I want you to think of the analogy to the less than or equal to and the less than. So all that that line under the subset symbol means is or equal to, okay? All right, so notice that in this problem, we have only three options for what they want us to fill in the blank. Equal to is not one of them. So we have to um, decide which of these applies. So in part A, we have ABC and we have ABCD. So to determine if you have a subset, you check to see if A, B, and C are all in the other set. And here we have all of them, A, B, and C. So it's definitely a subset. Okay, remember subset is the symbol with the or equal to. It's contained in or equal to. In part A, would it be true to say that it's also a proper subset or not? So remember, in order to be a subset and a proper subset, it has to be contained in, but not equal to. So what do you think? Is it also a proper subset? Yeah, it's both a subset and a proper subset because the D means that these two are not equal, okay? All right, so very good. So the answer would be both, both a subset and a proper subset. How about part B? First, is it a subset? So is the one in here? Yes. Is the two in here? Yes. Is the three in here? Yes. Is the four in here? Yes. This is a subset. Okay, is it a proper subset, part B? No. 
No, that's right. It's not a proper subset because it's equal to. And you can't have a proper subset if the two sets are equal. So the only one that would work would be the subset symbol. Okay? Subset includes the possibility of equal to. We could use equals, but remember that wasn't an option. So all we, you can even think of the proper subset as this, okay? Proper subset means it's contained in, but it's not equal to. Now, notice that if you have a proper subset, that it has to be a subset, but not the other way around. In other words, if you have a subset, it's not necessarily a proper subset because it could be equal to. So when you're asked if a set is a proper subset of another set, there are really two conditions that you have to consider. First, are all of the elements of the set in the other set? If so, then you definitely have a subset. If not, then the set is neither a subset nor a proper subset, and you can stop. Then you have to check if the set is a subset, you have to ask yourself, are the two sets equal? If they are equal, then the set is a subset of itself, but it's not a proper subset. But if they're not equal, then it's both a subset and a proper subset of the other set. So you try this. Determine whether bold N is a subset of bold W, a proper subset of bold of bold W, both or neither. All right, so first we have to remember from day our first class, what did the bold face N represent? What did this, what set of numbers did the bold face N represent? Anyone remember? What was that set called? It starts with an N, that's where it gets its, its uh, symbol from. Good, the natural numbers. The natural numbers are given that nickname because they're the ones that we first learn to count when we're kids. They, they appear visually in nature, right? We can count objects, one, two, three, and so on. And then what was the extra number that the whole numbers, the one denoted by a W, has in it that the natural numbers don't? There's only one extra number that the whole numbers have that the natural numbers don't. Very good, zero. So remember, it took a long time for humans to conceive of zero because you can't see the quantity zero. So um, in that sense, it wasn't natural to us. So when we add that to the set, we give it the nickname, the whole numbers. All right, so now what are we being asked? We're being asked whether N is a subset of W. I'm gonna write these down in symbols. So N being a subset of W would look like this. Whether N is a proper subset of W. Okay. Or both or neither. All right. So let's look at subset. So in order to be a subset, that means that the set is contained, the natural numbers would be contained in W and possibly or possibly equal to w so if you look at the set of natural numbers it starts with the number one which is in w two which is in w three which is in w and it continues on in that way so it would be true to say that the natural numbers are a subset of the whole numbers yes 
but is it is the set of natural numbers is it a proper subset of the whole numbers so the only way it would not be a proper subset is if it's actually equal so i'm just going to write down is the set of natural numbers actually equal to the set of whole numbers Another way of answering this question is, is there an element of the whole numbers which is not in the natural numbers? Because if there is, then they're definitely not equal, right? Yeah, that's right. It's a proper subset. It's not equal, and it's because of the number zero. So because we have the number zero there, that's in the whole numbers, but not in the natural numbers. Then we know that the two sets cannot be equal. And if they're not equal, then it is true to say that it is a proper subset. It's true that it's a subset, but it's also true that it's a proper subset. So that means the answer here is both. Okay. Okay, next topic is we're going to count how many subsets there are of a given set. We're going to start with a really tiny set and figure out how many subsets there are of this set. And then we're gonna try and look at a slightly larger set. And then we're gonna try to make a generalization about how many subsets any given set would have. So the set that we're gonna analyze first is the set containing exactly two elements, A and B. And the method that we're going to use for determining the the subsets of the set AB is we're going to make what's called a tree diagram. So to make a tree diagram, you want to have a column that asks the question, is A an element of the subset? And a column that asks the question, is B an element of the subset? The answer to each of these questions is either yes or no. So you start by making a little dot and you make two branches under the column of A is an element of the subset. Yes is one possibility, no is another. Now regardless of whether A is in our subset, B can either be in it or not be in it. So we're gonna draw branches coming out from yes and we're gonna say okay, A's, let's suppose A is in our subset, then um, we have two possibilities, either B is or B isn't in our subset. And then let's suppose that A is not in our subset, we still have two possibilities, either B is or B isn't in our subset. This tree diagram is listing all the possible outcomes for constructing subsets of the set we started with. Each branch represents a different outcome. So for example, working backwards, uh, by the way, reading these tree diagrams is easier in reverse. So if you wanna figure out what scenario this top branch represents, working backwards to the beginning, you see that this, this branch that terminates here represents the case where both B and A are in the subset. So one, subset is the set itself, AB. Now let's use a different color and we're going to look at the next branch. The next branch ends here. Following it back to the beginning, we have that B is not a, an element of the subset, but A is. 
So that would be just the subset containing A. This next branch, reading it backwards, starting here, it's going to go through yes and then no. So this represents the scenario that B is in the subset, but A is not. So that's just the subset with just B in it. And then the last branch, well, what do you think that represents? Can anyone tell me what subset we are going to get when you have no and no? Very good, the empty set, that's right. Remember, we learned in the last class that the empty set is actually a subset of all other sets. So we would expect that if we're using this, if I'm telling you that this tree diagram method is a way of listing out all possible subsets, one of the branches should represent the empty set, and it does. So what we see here is that there are four subsets of the set AB. There's the subset which is equal to the original set AB itself. There's the subset containing A, there's the subset that just contains B, and then there's the set, subset that contains neither one of the elements, the empty set. So if I asked you how many subsets are there of the set AB, you would say there's four subsets. What if I asked you how many proper subsets there are of the set AB? What would you say to that question? How many proper subsets? Very good, there's three proper subsets because remember, proper just means it doesn't equal the original set. So to count the proper subsets is just a matter of eliminating the one that's equal to the original set. So these three down here, those are your proper subsets. They're not equal to the original set. Okay, list all the proper subsets of the set 369. So what I'd like you to do is at home really quick, jot down what you think are the proper subsets of the set 369. You can use a tree diagram, but you don't have to. You can just try and list them in some organized way. And then I'm gonna show you how you can do it using a tree diagram. So at home, you should be trying to list out all the proper subsets of the set 369. I'll give you a clue. Some of the subsets will have two elements. Some of the subsets will have one element. And then there will be the empty set. It's okay to take a guess. The only thing that's not okay is just to not do anything because at least if you take a guess, you know if your instincts are correct or not. And then you can work, to, if they're not correct, you can work towards correcting them. You'll know where you went wrong. But if you just don't even try, then you're not gonna know, um, you know, 
what your own instincts are and how to correct them. Okay, so um, if I were you at home, I would, um, if I didn't want to use the tree diagram method, which I understand because tree diagrams uh, look a little overwhelming. There's a reason we're doing them, but you know, I can understand if you don't want to use them. But what you might do is first list all of the subsets that have just one element. So for example, there's a subset that contains just three, the subset that contains just six, and the subset that contains just nine. And then list all the ones that have two elements. So there's the one with three and six, there's the one with three and nine, there's the one with um, six and nine. Now I'm not going to list nine and three, for example, because remember the order in which these elements are listed does not matter. So that would be all of the ones that um, have two elements. And the only thing I'm missing now is the empty set. Remember the subset that's equal to the original set, we don't want that because we're looking for proper subsets. Okay, all right. So now let me show you how you would do this with a tree diagram. So what you would do is you'd make three columns. One column would represent the question, is three an element of the subset? Another column would represent the question, is six an element of the subset? And another one would represent, is nine an element of the subset? Okay, for each question, there's two possible answers. We're going to start with the first uh, question, is three in the subset? So there's two possibilities, either yes, we are including three, or no, we're not. Then we look at six. Regardless of whether three was in the subset or not, we still have two possibilities. So suppose that three was in the subset, then we could either have had six in there or six not in there. And if three was not in the subset, we also have either six is or six is not. So this brings us up to four different possibilities so far. And now we're going to answer the question, is nine in the subset? Each one of these branches is a different scenario, and in each case we still could have 9 or not 9 in the set, in the subset. So yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Each one of these branches represents one scenario. Okay, the first branch represents the scenario where we're including all three. If you don't see that, let me highlight it for you. Oops. Right, working backwards from the tip of the branch, following along, there's only one path you can take. And that path hits yes, 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 which means that all three of the elements are in the subset, three, six, nine. All right, now the next branch, who can tell me what subset the next branch represents? That would be the branch, let me get a different highlighter color here. That would be the branch ending here. Following it back, it would go yes, I'm sorry, no, yes, yes. Which subset, what elements are in that subset in yellow? You see the branch in yellow that goes through yes, yes, and no? Which elements are in that subset represented by that branch? Three and six, good. Okay, how about the next branch? Let's highlight this one in green here. This one has yes, no, yes. Yes, 
yes, no, yes. Remember, look at the, um, look above the branch to see what it's supposed to be including. What's going on here? Come on. Okay, so look above this, yes. That's saying that three is in the subset. Look above this, no. That's saying six is not in the subset. Look above this, yes. That's saying that nine is in the subset. So good, Gabby um, and Olivia and um, forget. Who has that screen name? Hold on. <laughs> Tanya, yeah. Gabby and Olivia and Tanya, you got three and nine. That's correct. Okay, how about um, give yourself a minute, those of you who um, have not done so already, I want you to look through these branches and jot down which of these subsets are represented by each of the branches. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five branches left that we haven't matched up with a subset. So jot down what each of those you think it is. Okay, do you have something written down? Remember, take a guess. If you're not sure, just see what you, you know, what your instincts are. All right, so the next branch that ends in no there has a yes and two no's. So that one is the one cont containing three. The next branch that ends in yes here has a no and two yeses. So that's the one um, containing six and nine. The next one, just six. Right, that's the one with the no, yes, no. And the next one, yes, no, no, in reverse order, contains just the nine. And then the no, no, no is the empty set. Okay, so that's how you get these subsets using a tree diagram. Now the tree diagram gives you all the subsets. We only wanted the proper subsets. So our proper subsets are the ones that are not equal to the original set. All right, so there are seven proper subsets and there are eight subsets altogether. Some questions will ask you to actually list the subsets or the proper subsets. Other questions will just ask you how many there are. So one of the reasons why we're looking at tree diagrams is so that we can start to see a pattern. <clears throat> Let me go back. And the pattern is, is that if you're always going to make a column for each one of the elements, then the number of elements is the number of columns. And each column has two possibilities, yes or no. So the first element we will always have two branches for. When we add in a second element, that doubles the number of branches, so we now have four branches. When we have a third element, then that doubles the four, which brings us up to eight branches. So that means that we have a pattern here that we can observe that it really doesn't matter what these elements are, three, six, and nine, A, B, and C, but the number of elements is gonna determine how many subsets we have. The number of branches in this last column is gonna be the number of elements. So when we have two, um, sorry, when we have three elements, we have two times two times two equals eight total subsets. 
you end up multiplying two times itself the same number of times as elements of the set. Okay, so if I asked you to create a tree diagram to list the subsets of this set, which by the way, drawing a tree diagram is a skill I would like you to have and it does take some practice, so you have to be practicing this on paper. If I asked you to create a tree diagram for this, how many branches would you expect your tree diagram to have? Well, there are four elements, which means you would have four columns. And for each of the columns, it's going to double the number of branches. So the first column would be two, the second column would double that, the third column would double that, and the fourth column would double that. Another way of writing this is two to the fourth power. And two to the fourth power is 16. So we would expect to have 16 branches on our tree diagram. And that corresponds to 16 subsets. So here's what that turns out to look like. Okay, we have the four columns asking if A, B, C, or, and D are in the subset. In each case, we have a yes or a no possibility. So notice that in the first column, we have two branches. That doubles for the next column, that's four branches, which doubles for the next column, that's eight branches, and that doubles again for the fourth column, which is going to be 16 branches. So that's going to be 16 different subsets. Each one of these branches, if you work backwards, is going to represent one of the subsets. So the top one's A, B, C, D. The next one is just A, B, and C, and not D. The next one leaves out C. It's got an A, a B, not a C, and then a D. The next one has two yeses and two noes, so A and B are in, but C and D are out, and so on. And you can identify with each branch which of the elements it's uh, including, and you get every single possible outcome, all 16 of the subsets. And how many of these are proper subsets? How many proper subsets are there of the set A, B, C, D? Or any four element set for that matter. Very good, 15, that's right. You can take the number of subsets, which is 16, and just subtract one from it, and you're gonna get the number of proper subsets. Hold on guys, I'm having some issues with my PowerPoint. Here we go. Okay, so you take the number of subsets, which is 16, and you subtract one, and you get the number of proper subsets, 15 proper subsets. The only one that's not considered to be a proper subset is the subset that's equal to it, the original set itself. Okay, so notice that each element doubled the number of branches in the diagram. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 equals 16. That's really 2 to the fourth power. 2 to the power of the number of elements. 
So we have a formula. Anytime you're asked not to actually construct the subsets, but if I just ask you how many of them there are, if you have n elements in your set, you're going to raise 2 to that power. So for example, if I look at the, sub, the set containing a, b, and c, and I want to know how many subsets there are, I would say 2 to the third power because there's three elements in the set and that would be 8. If I wanted to know the proper subsets, however, we have to leave off the set that the subset that's equal to the original set. So you have to subtract 1 from that. 2 to the third minus 1 is 8 minus 1, which is 7. So this is how you calculate the number of subsets and the number of proper subsets. So I might ask you, find the number of subsets and the number of proper subsets of the set M-A-T-H-Y, Mathy. <laughs> Alright, so what do you think? How many subsets of this set? So to answer the question, how many subsets of this set, you have to focus in on the number of elements or the cardinality of the set. So how many elements are in the set? The number of elements in the set, mathy, <laughs> is going to be one, two, three, four, five, five elements. So yes, Alexandra got it. You have to say two to the fifth power. Two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, times two is 32. Or you can use the x to the y uh, function on your calculator, raise um, two to the, or actually if you're using the TI30X2S, it's a little caret symbol. 2 to the fifth power on your calculator and you should get 32. So there are five elements in the set but the number of subsets is 32. So there are 32 subsets. How many proper subsets are there? Very good, 31, good. So you take the number of subsets minus one and you get the number of proper subsets. Okay. Okay, so here's a question taken from my math lab. It says, Anne, Bo, Carlos, Dean, Ed, and Felicia plan to meet at the hospitality suite after the CEO makes his speech at the sales meeting. Denoting these six people by A, B, C, D, E, and F, list all the possible subsets of this group in which three people show up. Okay, so this is a slightly different um, question than the ones we've looked at. They're not asking all possible subsets. They're asking all possible subsets of size three. So <clears throat> if you were to make a tree diagram, that would be huge because you have one, two, three, four, five, six different elements, possible elements of the set. And so you'd have six columns, remember each time doubling the number of branches and it would just get to be too big to be reasonable. Um, the reason we did the tree diagrams, one of the reasons, is just so we could observe the pattern and we could get the formula and understand where the formula came from. 
But that tree diagram includes three people, four people, five people, two people, one people, all the different size subsets, and it's more work than we need to do. So when you're asked for a specific size subset and you're asked to list them all, then I would recommend using a different method of systematic listing. The way that it works is first you're going to um, start with all the subsets that have A's in them and then go in alphabetical order. So what, my, what I mean by that is I'm going to list all the subsets of three people that have an AB, an AC, an AD, an AE, or an AF in them. So a three set subset that has both A and B in it would be ABC, ABD, ABE, and ABF. A three set subset that has A and C in it would be ACD, ACE, or ACF. Notice that I did not include ABC because I'm keeping them in alphabetical order. This ensures that I include everything and never repeat. So when I move on to AD, I'm not going to include ABD and I'm not going to include ACD. Those have letters that come before D. I'm only going to include AD and then letters after D. So ADE and ADF. And then for AE, I have AEF. And then for AF, none because there's no letter after F to, to make a third person. So these are the three element subsets, the sets of three people that have A's in them. And now we're going to discard the A. We've, we've got all the ones with A's and now we're going to list the ones with B's in them. Again, we're going to keep it in alphabetical order. So we're going to do all the ones that have B and C, all the ones that have B and D, all the ones that have B and E. So there's B, C, D, B, C, E, B, C, F. Then all the B, D's, B, D, E, B, D, F. And then all the B, F's that have not yet been listed, which is going to be B, E, F. There is no B, F combination because there's no letter after F. So we stop. Then we're going to do all the ones with C's in them. So we need the C, D's, the C, E's, and the C, F's. There's C, D, E, C, D, F. C, E, F, and then there's nothing after F, so we don't have anything to list there. Then we move on to D. You can have D, E, and D, F. So D, E, F, and then we move on to E, and E, F, we, there's no G, so there's nothing to list here. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a list that contains all of the subsets of size 3 of the original set A, B, C, D, E, F. In the counting methods chapter, we're going to revisit the system, systematic listing method, and then we're also going to look at a formula for counting these. But for right now, in this section, all I want you to be able to do is to list them. Okay, is there any question about this part or anything you'd like me to repeat? Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide, but you just, you type in a question. If you have one, I can always go back. By the way, in my math lab, the, this would be a multiple choice question and this would be the, the option that you would select. <clears throat> Okay, here's another question that might look similar at first, but in fact they're asking us something different. 
It says, Anne, Bo, Carlos, Dean, Ed, and Felicia plan to meet at the hospitality suite after the CEO makes his speech at the sales meeting. How many possible subsets of people of any size can show up? So two differences. One, we're talking about subsets of any size. And two, they're not actually asking us to list out the subsets. That would be more work than is necessary because they're just asking us how many. And we have a formula for that, right? So you tell me, how many possible subsets? Remember, we're thinking of this as the set A, B, C, D, E, and F, right? So we have a set with one, two, three, four, five, six elements. So how would you calculate the number of subsets of any size with no restrictions? Anyone have any ideas? Good guess. It has to do with the number six, but it's not six to the sixth power. Remember, think of the tree diagram. It doubles every, every uh, element of the set makes it double. So it's two times two times two times two times two times two or two to the sixth power. Not six to the sixth, but two to the sixth. Which, yes, Alexandra, that's right, that equals 64. Okay, so um, when you're asked how many, this is a much shorter problem than when you're asked to actually list the subset. Okay, so um, that's the end of uh, chapter two, section two, and now we're going to look at chapter two, section three, whatever we have time for in the next 20 minutes. Okay, chapter two, section three, we start to get into set operations, um, which If you recall what an operation is in a math, um, if you're talking about operations between numbers, then we're talking about things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Operations on sets are gonna be quite different. The sets are very different from individual and numbers. The operations we're gonna look at, you've probably experienced at some point before. There's the intersection of sets, the union of sets, Difference of sets might be new to you. And um, then we're going to talk about ordered pairs and Cartesian products of sets. And of course, Venn diagrams. All right, so the first uh, definition for this section is the intersection. Now, when you think of the word intersection in everyday life, probably you think of, you know, being out on the road driving and coming up to an intersection. An intersection is, uh, in, in everyday life, it's where the two streets overlap, right? And it's the same thing when we're talking about sets. So it's, in real life, it's what two streets have in common, and in set theory, an intersection is what two sets have in common. The way that we um, describe that is we say the set of all elements x such that X is an element of A, and it's also an element of B. It's what they have in common. The word and there is critical because um, we will see the set operation union as well, and the word and does not appear in the definition, which is a critical difference. So let's let me show you what I'm talking about when I say it has to be in one set and in the other. So if I'm asked to find the intersection of two sets, 
In part A, what I'm looking for is what the two sets have in common, their overlap. So in part A, for example, I look at this number one that's in the first set on the left, and I see if I have it on the right, and I do. So that means the number one is part of the intersection. Then I look at the number three in the first set, and I see it's also in the second set. So three is in the intersection. Then I look at the number five. Five is in the first set and five is in the second set. So that's also in the intersection. Then I look at the number seven and it's only in the first set. And I look at the number nine and it's only in the first set. So neither of those are in the intersection. Whatever's left in the other set also is not in the intersection because I've already checked all the elements of the first set. But you could just double check. Two is not in there, four is not in there, six is not in there. So the intersection of the two sets contains one, three, and five. There's also special cases with like, for example, the empty set. So what does the set two, four, six have in common with the empty set? So in order to have um, an element in the intersection, it has to be in both sets. And the empty set doesn't have any elements. So whenever you intersect something with the empty set, you get the empty set. Now let's talk about union. The union of two sets, I always say it's like... Um, um, like a marriage between the two sets. So the two sets are being united, right? And um, I always think of, God, what was that? Um, there was a TV show in like the 60s or 70s or something where the the two families, the, the man and the woman got married and they had a bunch, the, they each already had a bunch of kids and so they all became one big family. What was that? Anyone remember the name of that show? The Brady Bunch, yeah, so it's like the Brady Bunch, so we're going to take A and B and join them together, and anyone who's in family A is, and anyone who's in family B is all put together into one big happy family. Okay, so the definition of union is the set of all numbers X such that X is an element of A or X is an element of B. It could be an A or B, or both, by the way. Oh, yep, Brady Bunch, thank you. <laughs> Um, it could be an A or B or both, and it's still going to be in the union. We're putting the whole thing together into one big set. So for example, if we have 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9 union with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then um, it's good to be organized about it, so it would be a good idea to go maybe in numerical order, but you can do it however you want. The order doesn't really matter, it's just a way of being organized. But I'm going to put the number one in here, the number two in here, even though two is only in the set on the right, that's okay. The number three is in both sets, but it's still in the union of the two sets. The number four is only in that one, but still in the union. The number five is in both, but still in the union. Anything that I see in either set is going to be in the union. Seven and nine also there. Okay, so just make sure you got everything. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine in the new set. How about two, four, six union with the empty set? What do you think that would be? Anyone have an idea of what happens when we union 2, 4, 6 with the empty set? Yep, 2, 4, 6. Very good, Kira. So you're putting everything together into one big set, but the empty set has nothing to contribute. So you're just going to get 2, 4, 6. Oops. All right, so now let's talk about um, 
Venn diagram representations of union and intersection. Um, oops. There is a video that you can watch about uh, set operations. The link is in the PowerPoint. So I'm going to leave that for you if you want to look back at it. But I'm just going to say this. If I give you a Venn diagram, remember the most generic way to draw a Venn diagram with um, two sets is to show two circles with a little overlap. This covers all possible scenarios uh, for the two sets, what, what they may or may not have in common. The intersection A intersect B, which is the upside down U symbol, is going to be the region looks like a little bit like a little football shape um, that's the overlap portion between the two sets and on the other hand if I were to draw a Venn diagram for union here's my A and here's my B a union B is represented with the U shape and you would need to shade in Um, everything that's in A together with everything that's in B. The union puts it all together. So the intersection is the overlapping piece. The union is everything put together. Okay, another set operation that you're going to have to do is to subtract, basically. It's called the difference. Subtract one set from another. So when we do that, what we're really doing is taking away from one set anything that it has in common with the other set. So what's going to be left when we take A minus B, the difference of A and B, is going to be all the elements of A that are not in B. Okay, so let's to understand how that works, let's look at an example. Oh, I don't want to do that one yet. We'll come back to that one. Let me write one down here real quick. Maybe real quick. I can get my pen to work. Okay, so let's say that I have a set ABC and I want to take the difference of that set and the set BC. So you're taking away the elements B and C from the set ABC. So what's going to be left is just A, right? We take the B is taking away this B, the C is taking away this C, and all we're left with is A. Now people usually don't have a problem with that, but they get confused when we have a slightly different scenario. What if we took away from ABC the set B, C, D? So D isn't actually an element of the set ABC. It still works the same way. You can actually ignore D because D isn't in the original set. It has no effect whatsoever. And then you go ahead and take away C and you take away B and you're still just left with the set A, containing A. Okay, so let's look at some more complicated examples. Okay, so here we're told that our universal set U is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And then we have some sets within U. A equals A, B, C, E, H. B equals C, E, G, and C equals A, C, D, G, E. And in part A, we're asked to find A take away B. So the way that I work this out, is so I write down the problem, A take away B, and then I actually write down the elements that each of these represent. So A was the set containing A, B, C, E, and H, and I'm taking away from that the set B, which is C, E, and G. 
If your video is, starts to look blurry, you might need to, on your end, um, change to the setting 360. Okay, so um, taking away, G has no effect because G isn't in the set A. But we're going to take away E, and we're going to take away C. So that's going to leave A, B, and H. So that's the difference between A and B. How do you feel about that one? Okay, now let's do, uh, this will be the last thing that we do, and then we'll get off of the live chat. You guys have really stuck with me here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to erase this. <clears throat> Okay, now once again, no matter how complicated the expression gets, you just write it down and then replace the name of the set with what's actually in the set and just keep working on it. I want to remind you, okay, this symbol is the difference. That's where you're taking one set away from the other. This symbol is union. And this symbol here, the little dash, is complement, meaning everything that's not in the set. All right, so when you're working a problem that has more than one set operation, it's kind of like set operation, I mean, sorry, kind of like order of operations in with regular numbers in the sense that you're going to work inside the parentheses first, and then... Um, uh, the complement symbol is kind of like an exponent. It comes before any union or intersection. Okay, so you're going to work inside of parentheses. And then you're going to work any complements, complements of individual sets. Um, and then you're going to do any unions and intersections uh, from left to right. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to focus in on the parentheses first. So in the parentheses, we have B, which contains C, E, and G. And we're taking away from that the set A, which contains A, B, C, E, and H. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to write what C is yet. I'll do that in a minute. All right, so let's, let's perform this set operation of taking the difference. Remember the A and the B and the H, these have no effect on the difference because the first set doesn't contain them. But the C and the E are going to be removed. And so what we're left with in the parentheses is really just the set containing G. Okay, and then now we need to union that with C complement. Now remember you do the complement first, so let's write down what C is. C is the set containing A, C, D, G, and E. Well, we want the complement of that. And complement means everything that's in the universal set, but not in that set. So basically all you have to do is look back at your set U, your universal set, which represents everything under discussion, and remove from it the A, C, D, G, and E. So I'm gonna cross off A, C, D, G, and E. And whatever's left is what's not in the set C. So we have G together with, and then whatever's left in U, which is gonna be B, F, and H. You with me so far? 
So the complement of C is BFH, all the letters that were not in C. And now the last thing we have to do is to find the union. And union means put everything together into one big set. So we're going to have B, we're going to have G, we're going to have F, and we're going to have H all together in one big set. Okay, so I hope you found this uh, live chat useful. I appreciate that you were here and that you were participating and you will get bonus points for that. Um, I don't post the bonus points for quite some time in D2L, but don't worry, you'll, you'll have them. They will be there. So um, usually weekly, I'll 